it is no secret that I have quite the affinity for pouring money into cars that don't run. The problem we have here though, to keep buying more junk, I need to finish some of my current junk. First up on the list, my Corvette ZRY. We've already installed a brand new built LS9, a huge Kong 2650 supercharger, and even a set of big old sticky tires on the back. The issue we're having here though, is when I press this, I'm supposed to hear this. That doesn't sound right. Nah. Before we can actually fire this thing up, we have a lot to finish. Exhaust, wiring, fuel system, cooling. Oh, and we have 48 hours to finish it before I head off the TX2K for, um... Because nothing's quite as enjoyable as working on cars with a horribly short self-imposed deadline. Before we can do anything with it, we have to take care of this just massive rat's nest. There's a lot going on here in a very small area. You have our fuse box that goes about there. Ultimately, we're gonna put a catch cam right there. You have oil lines, you have heater core lines. It's a giant mess. As far as the wiring goes, we are pretty much together. I think we're about ready to power this thing up. It's been a long, long time. It's been so long. I'm not positive that it's not just gonna catch on fire. Three, two. Apparently I just finished gapping Alex when I shut this thing off for good. I feel like at this current moment, this car is like your computer after Y2K. It's just completely confused, no idea where it is. I am absolutely positive that every light that can be on in the dash is on. Air lights aside, it's progress and I'll definitely take it. It's funny how that works. It does indeed look as unfinished under here as I remember. We have to finish our exhaust setup. We do also need to put fluid in it. Very important that you don't forget that. Trust me, I'm speaking from experience. There's fuel stuff we need to finish. There's wiring stuff we need to finish under here. Basically what I'm getting at, we have a massive amount of work to do and very little time to do it. So I think we kind of just have to get started. doesn't look much different, but I promise you we've been hard at work for a very long time. Given our time constraints, I chose to do things in a somewhat unconventional way. The fluids, buttoning up the exhaust, that's all stuff I would typically do last. I did dedicate about 30 minutes earlier to going through the fuel system, some of the wiring, and seeing if we were missing anything. And it turns out we were, so it's a good thing we did. We needed ourselves a MAF extension harness. We weren't gonna be able to connect the MAF to where it sits up there in the intake. We also needed a couple fuel fittings. I believe we're gonna have everything we need now. After a very short hiatus we're back it's not so bright and early it is early it's not bright second week that we actually film into midnight so we yeah. kind of we kind of yeah we're beat we're, beat. we're, we're beat. tired <laughs> so here's my theoretical plan of attack today we still have to run all the cooler lines from that water tank in the back we still have to run the wiring to the auxiliary fuel pump that we're gonna save for a little bit later what I want to tackle right off the jump is everything up here we're waiting for some parts to come in they should be here about noon for the fuel system but we can definitely knock out everything on the front of this engine we can also knock out the whole radiator heat exchanger ac condenser assembly we also get to throw in this massive carbon fiber kong performance intake yesterday we put in a ton of work and frankly it doesn't look like much but today the car should really start coming together and actually looking like it's ready to start how do you think the mpg is going to be on this thing like five, six. If I'm lucky. <laughs> That's no fault of the car. Corvettes, even supercharged Corvettes can get good gas mileage. I'm not capable of good gas mileage, just so we're all on the same page. I don't think I've ever actually torqued water pump bolts before, but when you get a new tool, I mean, why not? As we start piecing together this accessory drive, we have ran into our first issue. One rusty 
Very rusty power steering pump installed. Oh, don't, come on, don't, don't show it. It's no need for that. Don't show it that close, come on. Now here's where things may or may not get just a little sketchy. You guys have seen this in a previous episode. Awesome Kong Performance Belt Tensioner. Fancy new Gates green belt, very popular with the supercharged cars. It doesn't slip too bad. I've already changed out my upper supercharger pulley to a 2.625 pulley. It's gonna raise the boost. I've also upsized the lower balancer 14% larger. There's a chance we're gonna have to change our idlers as well. If we need other idlers, we're gonna have to figure that out like now. I mean right now and go overnight them and hope they get here tomorrow. But before we can do that, we need to do a little um, modification, we'll call it. Now, this part might look a little sketchy. It's actually not. I've done this on every ZR1 I've built. You simply have to cut one rib off this belt. All right, easy belt done. Now we get to toss on this tensioner here and try for the not so easy one. With these cars, it's a constant game of fighting belt slip. So even when you have all the right stuff, you still need to push this tensioner to the absolute max to get the belt on it. I already know this is not gonna be a good time, but here goes nothing with the stock pulleys. If I'm recalling these sizes correctly, 76 millimeter, 100 millimeter. It's fairly common to take this one down to a 76 as well. Hopefully we're not gonna have to do that. And I kind of assume that it's hard to stretch that bit, right? Because the fact <laughs> that it's huge. These are made specifically to not stretch. So you would be right on that over the power steering pump. There, it takes care of that rust, doesn't it? I would like to thank Dalt for showing up just in time for the best part of the day. He has me help him with these garbage tasks to try and get this POS running. Her POS and had like a PTSD flashback about a juke, anyway. If this fits around the water pump, we're gonna be golden. If not, well, more overnight parts on the way. You so close. Ow. Ooh. Oh, there it is. There we go. Okay. Now, don't let go yet, Pete. What we have to hope is this comes off. These cannot be touching for obvious reasons. Let her go, Pete. Let's see what it does. <gasps> One huge concern of mine just got alleviated. We don't have to order any pulleys. It actually sits on there pretty well. On these cars that are notorious for belt slip, you want these pulleys to sit as close as possible together. The further the tensioner spun that way, the more pressure is on this. I think we're fairly close there. It was just the perfect amount of hard to get on. That's what she said. No. Thus far, I've had super high praise for these radium fuel rails on this car. The good news is they're super adjustable. We can run them any which way. The bad news, though, they're super adjustable, so we have to make a bunch of stuff instead of just plugging something in. Kind of look like you know what you're doing, you know? I kind of know what I'm doing, so I'm glad you put the kind of in there because that's about where <laughs> we're at right now. I have some bad news, guys. We might miss our deadline. Yeah, I'm not happy about it either, but... We could cobble this fuel system together with what we have, a lot of adapters, a lot of random lines, not the way I wanna do things. We can use all of these, or, or we can order ourselves three fittings and have the whole thing done. Radium makes some super slick fittings, and even though it's gonna delay us, which I'm not happy about, I think in the long run, we're gonna be really happy that we took our time and did things the right way. At this point, I've triple checked it. I think we're solid on this. We're gonna connect this line here that has our E85 sensor in it right there to that port. Dash eight fitting on that side, barb that this will plug directly into on the other side. Then we're gonna stick a 90 degree push lock on the end of that, stick that guy right there. It's gonna come around the front of the engine. We're gonna do the exact same thing right there. Boom, done. It's gonna be a super clean install, especially for an LS9 fuel rail setup. There's a little more going on there than your typical LS. Now, one more thing we can do before Fernando heads out on his own trip for a week bleed the clutch and of course now is where we get to take advantage of this guy right here and you're gonna see exactly why i was so hyped on installing this remote bleeder in the last episode all right go ahead and pump her up fernando where is it going here hold on before you bleed the clutch connect the clutch line it was poured fucking the oh, brake fluid, God damn it. Well, as you can see, Fernando's no longer in the driver's seat and we still don't have the clutch bled. It has not been a fun time trying to deal with this. At this point, we've put an entire bottle of brake fluid through it. It's bled somewhat, but we still have no pedal pressure. It's just a really weird situation. At this point, I'm thinking we might have a failed master cylinder. It 
does have 125,000 miles on it, or there is always the possibility that our slave cylinder that we just put in is faulty. Ultimately, it looks like even if we were able to figure that fuel situation out, we'd have been screwed by clutch hydraulics. It's an odd situation because with this much fluid ran through it, we should be able to see a leak somewhere if that was the case. It's definitely one of the weirder things I've encountered on one of these cars, but the only option now is to head on down the TX2K, get some motivation, and pick it up when we get back. Yeah, that'll do it. Back to work. Alrighty, we're back, we're motivated, and most importantly, we have parts. First and foremost, our fuel fittings. That should be fairly straightforward. As long as I was mathing correctly, that's all we're gonna need. We've got a nice new set of Goodrich stainless brake lines there. We've even got a fancy new, or used, I suppose, set of brake line brackets off that Z06 right there. The main part I've been waiting for, this clutch master cylinder. This entire trip, I've known in the back of my head that it's a legitimate possibility. I was gonna have to come back here and pull this entire drivetrain out. If we somehow found ourselves in possession of a faulty slave cylinder out of the box, we're not going to be in for a fun time. I'm hoping this guy right here solves our problem. If you look at the reservoir that's on this clutch master, it's clear. That means it's original to the car. A while back, they switched to these black ones. That's how you can tell if it's been replaced on a C6 that you have or one you might be looking at buying. While it would be somewhat of a coincidence that our master cylinder just went bad, I suppose it is possible after sitting so long. Either way, we're getting to the bottom of this today. Don't ask me why guys, but this is moving no fluid. This new master cylinder, I can't depress at all. So if I had to guess, I think this thing is fluid locked from the factory. Being that we have ourselves that check valve right there, there's no good reason we should be able to move fluid, period. And yes, in case you're wondering, this is full from the factory. Master's in, we got it full of fluid. I suppose it's about that time. Let's go ahead and get our answer. Okay, so it's actually getting a squirt of fluid this time as it should be. We were never, I mean, never able to get that kind of pressure out of it with that old master. So I'm hoping we found our problem here. He says the pedal feels good. He is Fernando's stunt double, so we don't have the expert here. Yeah, I think we're ready to bang some gears. Now we do still have the assist spring on. Maybe we'll take that off later down the road. It feels good, but it feels light. As I'm sure you guys can imagine, I'm thrilled to not have to pull this entire drivetrain back out. And that means we can tackle this fuel system now. First up on the list, what should be a very simple, but really elegant solution. Oh, well, it slipped past. Oh, it just did. Three two, one. You know, it's truly funny how things work really well when you have the proper stuff. This took pretty much no time at all, and I think we have a great solution here. It might look a little odd that I've tucked it behind everything, but there was a very good reason for that. This is the length of hose we needed to make sure we could actually connect these two fittings, and the one thing I did not want to happen is have it sitting out here, us throw a belt, it smacked that line, and then this car ends up looking a lot like this car. <laughs> With the way we have it ran, we should avoid that pretty well. I don't see any issues. Not only did we finish the rails, but we finished the ethanol content sensor. We took that white wire, and the way I like to run them on C6 is run it up through the wiper cowl, that weather strip right there, bring it back down on the other side of the motor, connect to a coil pack, run our sensor wire right there to our sensor. Now that we have our fuel lines done, there's only one thing left we have to do on the fuel side of things. We just have to install ourselves this little harness right here. That magic box is gonna be what makes sure we can operate that fuel pump right there and not run out of fuel when we're making four digit horsepower. We're running kind of an odd hybrid setup here. It's a partial DSX tuning kit. The lines, they're awesome, but we upgraded the pump, upgraded the wiring, this should supply enough fuel for that 2650. Get in the hole, go. Plug into our map sensor there. Original map sensor harness to the DSX harness. One more trip back through the wiper cowl here. 
Then, assuming you're a normal person, you would connect that ring terminal to that right there and be good to go. But you guys know I had to go and make things just a little difficult on myself. I wanted to mount that unit over there on that side of the fender tub. That leaves this wire just a little too short. We're gonna take just a couple extra seconds here and make this wiring 10 times cleaner. Just a couple minutes of extra work and we were able to route it down there behind the dry sign oil tank. We put some nice shrouding on it. Now I don't have to pop the hood and get pissed off at this red wire running across my catch can every time. Ready for something to catch on fire? No, don't say that. We already got the demon. We don't need another Stop. one. You know? True. Good point. Now, if I didn't screw up that wiring, which it was only one wire, how bad could I have messed it up? When I press this button right here, that fuel pump should turn on. What do you think the odds are that it actually comes on? What I need you to do is take this wire right here, connect it to the positive battery terminal. Just touch it so we can rip it off if things go south. We good? I heard something. Me too. Hey Pete, go hit that button. Well, we have fuel. We don't actually have any gas in the car, so we need to do that next to make sure nothing's leaking. This is awesome. I got you in camera. <laughs> it's always something with this stupid car. It's literally going to get wrecked leaving the dyno. I know. No, it. don't say that. One other thing we're able to do now, we can put a little gas in it. This is 93. My tuner, Fran from Race Proven Motorsports, asked that I bring it on 93. So as much as I wanted to go put E85 in it and smell that sweet alcoholic smell, that doesn't sound good. That, that was not a good way to phrase that, was it, Fernando? No. You, it's just because when you say alcoholic yeah, and I then Corvette, I, I just that. came to my memory. Like oh, the that Black other video? Six. Yeah. Either way, we're going to stick it on the dyno on 93 first, and then we'll move on to the 85. Yes or no? Car alarm coming back on? Yes. I need you to go up there. I'm going to put a little fuel to it, and if stuff starts spraying, just yell, all right? Okay. Good plan? How are we looking? Pretty good. Realistically, you'd be able to smell it. I was almost worried about this a little bit since it's such a tight angle, and it's a push lock, and I don't trust stuff with no clamps on it. I think we're good. Maybe our luck is turning around after all. <laughs> The last thing we have to tackle is this cooling setup here. These ZR1s already come with fantastic aluminum radiators. They're not really an issue, so there's nothing we need to do as far as that goes. What we need to do is add this guy right here. This is an Edelbrock heat exchanger that's been modified slightly. From Edelbrock, these guys come with one singular three-quarter inch inlet and outlet. On the one side, we've had Synergy Motorsports modify it with a one-inch outlet, and on the other side here, we've went dual three-quarter. We are going to have to get a little creative because it's going to have to connect to our trunk tank back here as well, but I believe with these fittings here in this massive amount of hose we have over in this bin, we should have everything we need to get it done. knew the stock heat exchanger was small, but it didn't do it justice being up here in this shroud. Now putting it down next to our new one. Oh my God. One thing I didn't know prior to now is it's made by KTM, the same company that makes your motorcycle. Do we do this the fun way or the smart way? Smart way. Wrong answer. That was really quick. And what's the saying? Measure zero times, cut once, something like that. Let's see if I nailed this or if I'm gonna look like an idiot on camera more than usual, at least. Why is it? Well, we did get that right. I would have figured for sure I would have screwed that up. I think at some point or another, we've all experienced trying to put a much bigger aftermarket part in and having it not fit great. We're of course getting it from both angles here. One, it's a massive heat exchanger that presents its own problems, but on its own, it's not that big of a deal. Now that we've modified this thing with 
bigger outlets. Inlets, that's where we're running into some issues. The shroud's not sitting flat on the AC condenser and we're having some rubbing issues there. What we really need to work out here is we need to get this to tilt further forward. The problem though, it's already up against this shroud. Realistically, the only resolution that I'm finding so we can tilt that forward, we can tilt this up so it fits properly, is heat the shroud up and try to push the heat exchanger into it. Hopefully it kind of bows it out and that gives us everything we need. God. Now for any kids, young mechanics, or first time older mechanics, remember, people always say you have to measure. You don't. We do have to cut the shroud a little more there, but we're plenty clear on that AC condenser. I don't know exactly how much room we have, but it's a ton. And yes, I know you guys see it. I see it too. We're definitely cleaning all that out. Right, just gotta get around that big throttle body there. That tucks under there just like that. I thought this was gonna be one of the more challenging parts because we're jamming something really big into a really small hole, but it worked out pretty good. Today is the day. I'm not leaving until I get this car done, and um, no, that's actually a lie. I will have to leave at some point, but nonetheless, today's the day. Fernando, you look confident. I'm feeling good, I'm feeling confident. This is starting. All that I gotta say is a terrible day outside. Agreed. But it's gonna be a great day in the shop. That was, that was cheesy. 10 out of 10, I love yeah. it, let's go. <laughs> Yeah, I'm aware we're starting with the boring stuff. It gets better, I promise. Oh, man, it's been some time. I forget where this bad boy mounts if we're being honest here. What I'm not gonna do is tell you guys exactly how much time I just spent trying to figure out where this power steering cooler goes. It's kind of embarrassing, so we're not gonna talk about it. What it mounts to, that guy there, that guy there. Stock heat exchanger, we're obviously not using it. So now we have to find another solution. You forgot the stage there, equipment. Good idea. There's our nice elegant solution. Those lines looks really low. They are very low. Once we do something to secure that side there, we're gonna have to tie them up over and out of the way. This looks really fancy. These are actually a new product. Um, well, they were a new product when I ordered them a year ago. I suppose they're not so new anymore. Timelines aside, this solves the issue of having a big plastic radiator support. You might be wondering to yourself why it matters if we have a bulky radiator support. That intake clearance. Trust me, you're gonna understand soon. I'm digging that, that's a really cool piece. This is the first time I've used one of those. Shout out cords. As this car is coming back together and actually doing it very well and easily, I did find one issue, we're missing a coolant line. There's a hard plastic line that runs from this nipple here all the way over there and then a couple different places. I totally forgot that when I took this car apart, it broke. As you might imagine, this leaves us in quite the dilemma. We can't get that line today. So unfortunately, again on this car, we're gonna have to exercise just horrible judgment and start it without coolant. I think it's well established that at this point, if there's a problem that I can just ignore, I'm gonna do that. One thing we can't ignore, this. This coupler was originally made for a 102 millimeter throttle body. This is a 112 millimeter throttle body. Of course, this was another thing that I didn't realize until I went to test fit it last night. We do have the correct one on the way, but again, I'm not letting anything stop us right now. We're already like four days over on this build. This car has to run today. It just has to. As of right now, it's definitely gonna hit the hood right there. On my last ZR1, it did rub a little bit, so I put a little bit of stick on felt and that worked pretty well. But without this right coupler here, it's gonna hit pretty egregiously. At this point, as far as the front of the car goes, the engine bay, I think we're pretty good. The only remaining thing we have left to do today is run those lines from there all the way up to here and connect them to these guys. So everything I just said, just forget about it. What started as an honest attempt to fully finish this car has kind of went down a different path. It's now started at all costs. Missing OEM coolant line, no big deal. Wrong intake setup, who cares? Somehow only end up with one inch hose and not three quarters hose that we desperately need for this stuff. Kind of a problem, but once again, Fernando, what's the motto? Can we start it like that? I think. Good enough for me. I thought I was ready for this. But <laughs> I'm not ready for so. it. 
I've been talking a big game, but now I'm kind of scared. Three. This has been a long time called fucking count it down, Fernando. Two. One. I take that. <laughs> what do you I mean I'll that. take that? I mean, he's getting fuel. What was it? Leaves. It's just leaves in the fan. Oh, okay. okay. Oh. We have a lot of code. It's a lie! <laughs> Did you shut it off? Didn't show oil pressure. <gasps> we obviously have a massive amount of codes, including, of course, PO522, the engine oil pressure switch. Guys, this was supposed to be an awesome ending to this video, and now it's not. The one saving grace, though, being this engine was ran on an engine dyno, we know it had oil pressure there. So I'm 99% sure it's something electrical. The oil pressure sensors tucked way back there. I can feel it. It is plugged in. I don't know if it's something else that's not working properly that's causing that issue, but we have a lot more work ahead of us. What do we do here? What do we call this? It's definitely not a win. We can't call it a win. But at the same time, we didn't fail. Well, because we made huge progress in the well. <laughs> We did make a ton of progress. Even if we raised a bunch of questions, at least we heard this car come to life for the first time in over a year. Over a year, Fernando, and it finally runs, although it might not run for another 30 seconds if it doesn't actually have oil pressure. I don't know. I was really hoping by the end of this video, we'd have 99% of the hard work done. It would be cake from here. We're supposed to have this car on the dyno a week from now. I thought the past week and a half getting this car ready was kind of a pain. I have a feeling the next week's gonna be even worse. The only thing we can do now is get back in here first thing tomorrow morning and try to figure out what the f is wrong with this car. <laughs> I feel bad, you know? But, um, yeah. I'm supposed to hear this. He's gonna be my voice. Yes, it is. <laughs> what a flex. Be a bigger flex when I learn to put the batteries in without dropping them. Coming up in three, two, one. I'm stuck, hold on. Is it, oh, yeah, okay. Here we are. Last time you saw this connected. <laughs> Ultimately, it looks like even if we were able to figure the clutch situation out, we'd have been screwed by the cut. Jesus Christ. Those safety squints aren't working out. Don't worry about that. That was that noise was unimportant. I do like a peanut butter in my mouth from that thing. I'm like, I feel like a dog that just like ate up peanut butter. <laughs> you can either hold this and definitely don't let go because me or Austin will lose a finger. 